The Great Museum Theft. This is a true story of the world's single largest property theft. At the end, we tell you how you can help. The heist has a potential value of over $500 million. The FBI said it believed the artwork was moved through organized crime circles to Philadelphia, where the trail went cold around 2003. Did Jimmy Marks have anything to do with this? He was gunned down while unlocking the front door to his apartment in the Boston suburb of Lynn. He was a known career criminal. His mob-style death is also unsolved. The Great Museum Theft It was a cool, wet night in Suffolk County on March 18, 1990. It was the perfect time and conditions for a heist. With the wind blowing out the northwest, it would carry the sound of an idling van away from nearby buildings, and the wet, rainy environment would muffle the sounds as well. Since it was St. Patrick's Day, even at this late hour there were still revelers out on the streets. The two thieves who were dressed in Boston police officers' uniforms stood outside the locked door to that security area at 1.24 in the morning. They stood outside the security area where the only two guards were stationed. They announced to the security guards that they were there because of a report of disturbance. The guards thought that is, was plausible, since it was St. Patrick's Day night. It was a violation of protocol, but the security officers let the thieves in that were dressed as police officers and buzzed them. Once they were inside, they were able to make their way over to the guards. They started to talk to them about the disturbance call as they were walking over to them that they were responding to. But once they got in position, they overpowered the guards, and then from that point, they duct-taped their eyes and mouths. Once they had the guards subdued, they took them downstairs to the basement. They placed the guards in the basement, in different spaces away from each other. They then handcuffed them to the pipes there and made sure that they could not escape to warn anyone. At 1.48 in the morning, the internal alarms from the motion sensors started going off to indicate that someone was on the landing just outside that doorway of the Dutch room on the second floor. The thieves knew that they could take their time now since all the guards were restrained down in the basement. From that moment, they first got to the only seascape painting ever done by Rembrandt. This was the only Rembrandt left in Massachusetts because all the other paintings were robbed before this one. Picture the seascape, stormy skies, Windy, dramatic lighting, a boat full of men pitches in dangerous waves. It's Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. One man looks directly out at us. It's Rembrandt's own face, a self-portrait he included in the biblical story. Rembrandt's most striking narrative painting in America, Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, is also his only painted seascape. Dated 1633, it was made shortly after Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam from his native Leiden, when he was establishing himself as the city's leading painter of portraits and historical subjects. The detailed rendering of the scene, the figure's varied expressions, the relatively polished brushwork, and the bright coloring are characteristic of Rembrandt's early style. 18th century critics often preferred this early period to Rembrandt's later, broader, and less descriptive manner. The biblical scene pitches nature against human frailty, both physical and spiritual. The panic-stricken disciples struggle against a sudden storm and fight to regain control of their fishing boat as a huge wave crashes over its bow, ripping the sail and drawing the craft perilously close to the rocks in the left foreground. One of the disciples succumbs to the sea's violence by vomiting over the side. Amidst this chaos, only Christ, at the right, remains calm, like the eye of the storm. Awakened by the disciples' desperate pleas for help, he rebukes them. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? And then rises to calm the fury of wind and waves. Nature's upheaval is both cause and metaphor for the terror that grips the disciples, magnifying the emotional turbulence and thus the image's dramatic impact. The painting showcases the young Rembrandt's ability not only to represent a sacred history, but also to seize our attention and immerse us in an unfolding pictorial drama. For greatest immediacy, 
He depicted the event as if it were a contemporary scene of a fishing boat menaced by a storm. The spectacle of darkness and light formed by the churning seas and blackening sky immediately attracts our attention. We then become caught up in the disciples' terrified responses, each meticulously characterized to encourage and sustain prolonged, empathetic looking. Only one figure looks directly out at us as he steadies himself by grasping a rope and holds onto his cap. His face seems familiar from Rembrandt's self-portraits, and as his gaze fixes on ours, we recognize that we have become imaginative participants in the painter's vivid dramatization of a disaster Christ is about to avert. They take the painting down off the wall and lay it down on the floor face up. They then proceed over to the other side of the same wall. There was a Rembrandt painting of a Dutch couple. Using the same method, they took the painting down and placed it face up on the floor. The Stormy Skies painting was about 160 centimeters by 128 centimeters and an oil on canvas painting and was completed when he was 29 years old. It was the largest known historical work that he completed. The second painting they took down is the A-Lady and Gentleman in Black, better known as the couple. This oil on canvas painting was 131.6 centimeters by 109 centimeters. They then used a sharp blade to cut both paintings out of their frames. There were deep gashes on the wood supports around the edges and left the supports behind. After they removed these painting, they moved to what they thought was another Rembrandt painting next to the desk next to the wall, near the windows. There was a landscape painting here known as Mountains and Cloudy Sky. Little did the thieves know that this painting was not an original Rembrandt, but a painting done by one of his students. As they moved around the desk and then proceeded to pull down one more painting there, they then took down the Vermeer painting called The Concert, this one features a woman playing a keyboard instrument, a clavichord, a man seen from behind with a viola, another woman, her mouth open in song, an amazing domestic interior. The thieves move this painting to the area by the large tables in the middle of the room. Then, holding the frame and the glass face down, they remove the canvas and let the frame fall. The crime scene photos show the frame with the broken glass inside it. All these are great loss, but Vermeer only made 36 paintings during his entire life. To point out something that's really incongruous that is out of step with the rest. As you're facing the empty Vermeer frame and the wall with the two big missing Rembrandts and looking towards the right side of that wall, there's a tall portrait of a man in red. In front of it, there's a table with a cloth cover, empty now. That night, there's a Chinese bronze vessel on this table, shaped like a beaker, about 10 inches tall. It is very old 12th century BC, but not unusually valuable. When the thieves first try to grab it, it won't budge. They think it's connected to the cloth, so they cut the fabric, but that still doesn't work. It's attached to a heavy metal base underneath the cloth. They banged up that base to separate it from the vessel. Moving towards the doorway, just to the right of that doorway, there's a chair and a wooden cabinet. On the side of the cabinet next to the doorway, theirs was a small frame. In that frame was a black and white etching. This etching was about the size of a postage stamp. Yes, this was yet another Rembrandt painting. They unscrewed the frame from the cabinet. So confident that no one was coming to get them, they take the little frame with them and go over to a large table in the middle of the room. There they stood there and unscrewed the frame to remove the etching. According to the censors throughout the room, that process took them almost five minutes to do. In most thefts, that is a very long time. From there they go after the last Rembrandt in this room. It is hanging just above the cabinet with the etching. It was in a gold from and was a self-portrait of Rembrandt himself. They take this painting down and lean it against a chest underneath the painting. They left this artwork because the backing on this painting was not the back of the actual painted wood panel. The additional panel is there. 
As they left the room where they spent nearly 40 minutes there, they forgot the self-portrait painting. It's so important that this Rembrandt self-portrait is still here, not only because it's a masterpiece. He's just 23 years old when he paints this. He wants to become a successful artist, and he's showing off what he can do. The light, those textures, the velvet, the feather, and his hair. As one of the thieves is still taking some of the paintings out of their frames, his partner moves on. He goes through the doorway next to the Rembrandt, that's still here. He moves through this hallway in the dark. He goes into the gallery straight ahead. The motion sensors record him passing through this space. He doesn't take anything. Then he turns right through the doorway. He moves into the next gallery. This one had the red walls. It's full of incredibly valuable and rare masterpieces. Here he takes nothing. He's got a different destination. It's through the doorway ahead, into that narrow gallery immediately through the doorway. It's called the short gallery. The panels on the right, with all of the framed prints and drawings are his target. The panels swing open, with multiple layers behind them. Of course, the panels are closed and locked at night. He goes to the third cabinet door to the right of the doorway. Here he proceeded to break open the locks that closed the panels and then he removed five drawings which then takes from here. They're all by the artist Edgar Degas. Three of them are images of jockeys and horses. Looking to the right of the cabinet, here he takes one additional object from this room. Was it a flag from Napoleon's guard regiment? The thief tries to unscrew the frame to remove the flag. He does take out a few of the screws, but then he gives up. Why doesn't he just break the glass? They broke the glass on he drawing they took from the cabinet. He took the screws and tossed them into the sand bucket next to the fire extinguisher. Those screws actually held a bronze eagle on the top of where a short piece of metal was protruding from the frame. He took that eagle and left the flag. From there he takes the object he took from the other room, back to where his partner was just finishing up liberating the paintings from their frames, the next room, before the hallway back to the Dutch room, is the early Italian room. This room is called the Chinese room. There's a glass-covered cabinet with four shelves inside. On the second shelf from the bottom are two bronze bears. Remember that Chinese bronze vessel the thieves work so hard to get in the Dutch room. Well, these ancient Chinese bears are much more valuable, much more rare, and the thieves pass right by them. After they finished up in this room, they headed back down the stairs the same way they came up, the stairway just outside the room. On the second level, they stole six pieces from the Dutch room and six pieces from the short gallery. All were the paintings, drawings, and the eagle. That makes a total of 12 pieces that they took from this level. There was just one more piece they wanted, and it was downstairs. They move around the courtyard until you're in the North Cloister, which is the corridor with the benches and red cushions, on your way to the red cushioned benches. From this level, the thieves go out the security entrance from which they entered. It used to be in an area not far from where they came down the stairs. Separately, they make two trips to load the stolen works into their vehicle. By this time, it's 2.45 a.m. They've been in the museum 81 minutes. Imagine that, an hour and 21 minutes. Most art heists are quick grabs and dashes of five to 10 minutes. They then took one more artwork. At this point, the motion sensors did not pick up their movements into the room or in the room here, so it's not really known when this one was taken. They moved through the metal gates and ahead and to the right was the way to the blue room. From this doorway into the blue room, moving directly ahead, there's a half wall coming into the space from both sides, moving beyond that, almost at the other side of the room. On the right, there's a large painting of an older woman dressed in black. It's by Edward Manet. And just underneath, it held a portrait of a man in a top hat, also by Manet. The big Monet of the women dressed in black was in the conservation lab. They only took the small Monet in this area. They left the frame at the security desk as they left. 
The motion sensors everywhere else in the museum guided us as to how the thieves moved. But at no time do the sensors go off in this room. The next morning, it's confirmed that the sensors in this room are working perfectly. Investigators try to figure out how the thieves avoided detection. No one can get by the sensors. It's like two different crimes. Everything that's taken on the second floor was done one way. This painting was done another way. The thieves don't touch anything else in the blue room or on the first floor, and they never go to the third floor. As they left, they took the printout of the ID matrix printer, showing all the sensor alarms that track their movements throughout the heist. Little did they know, at a later time that once the authorities pressed print again on the printer, it would reprint the entire event. They also took the videotapes of all the cameras before they left. Could this be an inside job? The thieves put all the items into their van and left the scene. Remember that it was wet outside and overcast, light rain. All this muffled the start of the engine and the getaway itself. This case is still an open and active case. The local police and FBI are still actively still looking for any reliable info, not theories on this case. They want so much to get these items back in good shape. The 1990 theft of 13 works of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum's collection remains unsolved. Although the museum's commitment to resolving the crime has never diminished since its occurrence 33 years ago, the museum, the FBI, and the U.S. Attorney's Office are still seeking viable leads that could result in safe return of the art. The museum is still offering a $10 million dollar reward for information leading directly to the safe return of the stolen works. A share of the reward would be given in exchange for information leading to the restitution of any portion of the works. A separate reward of $100,000 is being offered for the return of the Napoleonic Eagle Finial. Anyone with information about the stolen artworks should contact the Gardner Museum directly. Confidentiality is assured. Thanks for listening to another podcast of the True Crime Tales. Please come again and remember, please subscribe.